Hi, I'm Sean Ray, IFBB professional bodybuilder. This video is titled The Final Countdown. And basically what it is is a video to walk you from A to Z through the 1998 Mr. Olympia. It's been 10 years that I've been competing in this contest and I've been in the top five for eight of those years. Last year I was third and this year I plan on winning the contest, but that's not what this video is about. This video is about training, nutrition, supplementation, competition, determination, willpower, motivation, and all of the other adjectives that come along with being a champion bodybuilder. Hopefully by the end of this video you will see that on any level of competition what it takes to become a champion. Hopefully what I'll convey to the viewer will be that if you put your mind, heart, and soul into something, win, lose, or draw, you'll get the satisfaction that you're looking for. Hopefully my satisfaction will come in the form of a Sandow Trophy and the 10th Mr. Olympia champion ever in the 32 year history. But my motivation is beyond that. My motivation is beyond just winning the Mr. Olympia. I'm making this video to show you that at 12 weeks out, we weren't born this way and we don't look this way on the day of a show. It takes a certain amount of time to achieve a certain appearance that we only sustain for a short period of time. So at 12 weeks out, I'll look significantly different by the time this video is over. And the reason I'll look different will be because I'm gonna be training twice a day. I'll be doing upwards of an hour of cardio a day. I'll be tanning, I will be posing, I will be dieting, and I'll be working on my mental mindset to become the next Mr. Olympia. That's not something that's easily accomplished. Like I said, with nine champions in 32 years, I hope to become the 10th. In order to do that, I'll need every bit of energy and willpower and drive and determination I've ever had. I'm going up against the likes of Flex Wheeler, Nasser El Sambadi, Kevin Lavroni, and Ronnie Coleman, to name a few. All of these guys are champions in their own right, and they're not going to roll over. I don't think I'm going to out-muscle mass these guys, so what I've got to do is out-train them. I've got to out-diet them. I've got to will myself to be a better bodybuilder than they are and come October the 10th at the Madison Square Garden in New York City. What you see on this tape will reflect my hard work and dedication to become a champion. The one thing I want to convey to the viewer is this. This video is not about winning and losing the Mr. Olympia. This is about showing you how to become Mr. Olympia. And if at the very least I don't happen to become Mr. Olympia, it will show you the road and the journey to getting to the Mr. Olympia platform and to try to do battle with giants. In lieu of the fact that I'm one of the shortest and one of the lightest guys in the contest, I'm going up against a lot of giants. And in the form of Nasser El Sambadi at 275 and Paul Dillette at 270, Flex Wheeler at 230, these guys are monsters. I'm 210 pounds, 5 foot 7. A lot of people told me I could never do it. I've been in the top five in the world for the past eight years. I don't plan on stopping now. I don't plan on letting up. The reason that I've managed the success that I have will follow as you continue to watch this tape. You'll see how I came to be. And hopefully this will be the one year of preparation that puts me over the top. And I lay claim to my place in history alongside Larry Scott, Sergio Oliva, Chris Dickerson, Frank Zane, Samir Banu, Franco Colombo, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Lee Haney, and of course, Dorian Yates. I want everyone to know that I'm as disappointed as the next guy, that Dorian Yates is not here this year due to an injury. He's always been a motivating factor in terms of me gearing up for the biggest contest of my life. Of course, I look nothing like Dorian, and he's on the opposite end of the spectrum, but him just simply being the champion has a tendency to bring out the best in all of us as competitors, and with his absence, Whoever wins the contest, there will always be an asterisk because I thought that the next Mr. Olympia would be the one that beats Dorian Yates, and I thought that might be me. In lieu of his injury, Flex Wheeler is very formidable. Kevin Lavroni has the same force to be reckoned with, placing twice in the Mr. Olympia, 1992, 1992 and 1995. Nasser El Sambadi getting second place in 1997. Flex Wheeler getting second place in 1993. These are the guys to beat, and they're very much capable of becoming the next Mr. Olympia. So what you're gonna see on this tape is my assault and my attack on how to beat these champions, these giants. 
and show you that at 5'7 and 210, if you put your mind, body, and soul into it, you can accomplish whatever it is you try to accomplish. Mine happens to be becoming the 10th Mr. Olympia and taking my place in history. If by chance that doesn't happen, this tape will reflect to you the hard work and dedication I put into my bodybuilding for the past 11 years as a professional athlete, and that the satisfaction that I get from the sport has a lot more to do with the journey than the actual victories that I've had over the years. The Mr. Olympia title has been the one title that's evaded my whole career. That's why this time around I'm going to put even more focus and concentration into it. And the title is aptly named The Final Countdown because I believe if I happen to win this show, this will be the nail in the coffin. The end of the road for me in terms of satisfaction. My destiny is to become Mr. Olympia. In the next hour, you'll witness the final countdown to the 1998 Mr. Olympia. And we'll see what happens after the show. Usually when I'm training any muscle group, it doesn't matter which particular exercise, as long as it's a leg exercise. People want to know what the difference between squats, presses, extensions, and lunges. I don't try to get too scientific and figure out what the difference is. Because on one given day, I might have close grip or widespread. It's going to hit different parts of the thigh, different parts of the hamstring. Big four leg exercises. Today, I'm doing lunges, leg press, squats, and extensions. The next time that might change, I might do half squats, single leg leg press, single leg leg extensions, and uh, you know different variations of leg equipment. We've got body masters, flex equipment, I carry in, different types of equipment. So my suggestion is to pick three or four exercises per body part, work your legs, and then pick three or four different ones on the next time. Don't get scientific about the inner head or the outer head of the quadricep. Train and train hard. That's the key to the game. Right now, I'm on my third exercise, this is squats. On any given day, I might walk in and start with squats. So sometimes I'm stronger or weaker, depending on where I do the squats in my routine. But every time, I try to put it all out on the line, train as hard and as heavy as I can. And uh, today, I'm training with three people, two other partners. Sometimes I train with one other partner. And a lot of times, I train by myself. So the pace of the workout sometimes can dictate how much weight you can handle. So usually, when I have two partners with me, I train a little slower and a little heavier but uh, keep it simple. 
Results come from hard work and intensity. I mean, the number one word is consistency. Train very consistent and you'll get to where you want to go. Thank you. Okay, as you know, every bodybuilder needs his energy to train and train hard. We diet for about 12 weeks, and uh, a few of the foods that we are going to be discussing are laid out here in front of me at one of my favorite restaurants, The Sizzler. This is where I have a tendency to tr come and eat right after I get done training, and I will describe each and every item in front of us and uh, show you what you can eat rather than what you can't eat. All right, this first item here is a bocce chicken, dry. We have two chicken breasts with a little taste of lemon to flavor and season. Give it a little bit of taste. We have our broccoli here, a, a form of complex carbohydrates with a dry baked potato. This, my friends, is teriyaki sauce. It's a no-no. Get rid of it. Don't even buy it. So what we have is protein and our complex carbohydrates. This is a typical lunch for me after I get done training, along with some iced tea and some equal to give it a little bit of flavor. Over here we have a salad. Now, I have a tendency to eat a lot of salads and I bring my own protein. I usually eat two cans of tuna fish that are packed in water that's low sodium. I just put the tuna fish on top of it. I have my dark greens, I have some onions, some uh, eggs, so I take out the yolks and I mix my tuna fish all up in there and I usually drink about two or three sizes of water, about this size to wash it all down. Uh, no complex carbohydrates for this meal. It's all protein and roughage. Over here, we move over into my next meal, and this is a, a New York steak with broccoli, no complex carbohydrates. I'm getting a lot of my energy from the fat that's in the steak, and generally speaking, I eat two of these. Two steaks with a larger portion of this broccoli, complex carbohydrates, and uh, I kind of stay away from the starchy carbohydrates at this stage on my third meal of the day. Over here, we move into fish. I usually will eat my fish totally dry. This is trout, grilled. Sprinkle a little bit of lemon wedge on it just to give it a little bit of flavor. It's got plenty of protein, and I'll eat a uh, baked potato dry, and I usually will go to the gym and train for my second time after that. And I generally have about two glasses of water this size or an iced tea. Over here, this is my treat. This is the, uh, I consider it almost like cheating. I'll have a mixed assortment of fruits uh, immediately after I train as I prepare my dinner. I have pineapple, I have cantaloupe, I have a little bit of honeydew, some watermelon, and some grapes. This satisfies my sweet tooth and my craving for uh, sugars. Um, generally, I'll have a cup of coffee before I do my workout. And uh, after I get done eating this, right after I train, uh, I'll usually have about 12 egg whites and uh, some more broccoli or asparagus to uh, fill me up. My last meal usually takes place about mm, 10 o'clock at night and uh, that last meal doesn't have complex carbohydrates. I don't know how many calories I consume. I have no idea how much body fat I, I uh, have on my body. I'm not very scientific. I eat when I'm hungry, and generally my emphasis is on the protein. That builds muscle. Usually I'll eat my complex carbohydrates just after or just before I train. I usually use the mirror as my guide. When I want to lose more body fat, I increase my cardio and cut back my complex carbohydrates. When I want to fill out a little bit more, I'll add an additional meal by waking up at maybe 5 o'clock in the morning and going a bit to bed a little bit later, maybe 11 o'clock. That way I can add one or two more meals, get a few more calories in me. But uh, when you're on a diet, you're gradually going to get a little bit weaker. And in a sense of getting weaker, that's not something I concern myself with. That's why I look in the mirror. As long as I'm getting more cut and I'm getting harder, my diet is taking place and my cardio is taking place, that's when I start to pay attention to the condition of my body and I pose and I flex and I squeeze. 12 weeks and I'll see you in New York. Okay, this is where a lot of bodybuilders shop, Max Muscle. These clothes are specially fit for oversized bodybuilders uh, that have weird dimensions. So for the short guy that has broad shoulders, they make extra wide shirts. Uh, they have everything from uh, short sleeve to tank top. 
baggy shorts for uh, for training in because a lot of bodybuilders have pretty big legs. Uh, of course, they got the spandex shorts as well, different varieties. Uh, different companies make this stuff, Hot Skins, Ruthless, uh, Perfetto, um, long ones. I prefer long black ones, actually. But, of course, uh, Max Muscle is designed for bodybuilders. They cater specifically for bodybuilders. You can get your posing trunks here in assorted colors. Um, purple, green, blue, red. They have different sizes, small, medium, and large. So, of course, you don't want to buy your posing trunks uh, two months out from a contest and you have 20 pounds to drop because, obviously, the shorts won't fit you properly. So, generally, what I do is I'll find a pair of uh, posing trunks that I can lay out in and tan in. Uh, for several weeks before a contest and then I find the color that I like uh, this year it may be red in the week of the contest uh, I will buy these shorts actually I buy two for safety one's for prejudging and the other one is for the night show so that when the photos are taken I can tell what part of the day it was in so if I wear red at prejudging every photo I take that's wearing red shorts I know that was prejudging then I wear blue at the night show it's a fresh clean pair there's no oil stains there's no pro tan on it uh, I know that the photograph is taken from the night show, so I can kind of see if I got tighter uh, from prejudging to night show or if I smoothed out after what I ate after the prejudging. So that's a little trick of the trade I use. And also, it, uh, for, for photos' sake, uh, they last a lot longer because every year there's two different colors on stage, um, you know, lots of variety. I've worn red, I've worn green, I've worn uh, orange in Helsinki, Finland, 1992. So I can almost remember what colors I wore and what year. This was purple I wore in 1991 in uh, Orlando, Florida. Um, the green I wore 1997 in Long Beach. So that's how I kind of keep a gauge of what I look like a certain year um, from prejudging to the night show. Uh, they also offer uh, bodybuilding shoes for the bodybuilder. Atomics, these shoes are uh, specially designed for lightweight training, um, flat soles, especially for calves. You don't want a big, bulky, Nike shoe on when you're trying to work your calf. You want a flat sole and something very lightweight. White, black, um, different colors, high tops and low tops. Uh, the owner, Kevin Mitchell, has a tendency to send me about five or six pairs so that before the Mr. Olympia, uh, I can do my training and look good doing it, as well as uh, they look good in photo shoots. And uh, here we have the Protan. Protan is a last minute application that a lot of bodybuilders use to uh, darken their skin because when you're on stage, the lights are very bright. We have a tendency to look a lot more smooth the lighter we are. Even for the black bodybuilder, a little color is good because the lights are made for TV and for video. Pro tan, I generally put on two applications. Uh, I put on one um, Friday night, or Friday morning, and I put on another one Friday night. And by Saturday afternoon, I'm ready to go. But prior to putting this on, I get a four-week base tan from using natural sunlight or from the tanning bed. So if I do it, as dark as I am, of course, the lighter you are, the more color you may need. So you may need to begin tanning naturally a little bit further in advance because as a professional bodybuilder, we take pictures about two weeks before and two weeks after the show. So we have to have a nice, rich color uh, that'll bring out the separation and definition. Pro tan. Uh, I usually go through maybe half a bottle per show. Okay, over here, of course, they also sell weightlifting gloves. And this was me, Saranac Gloves, the Muscle Blast Glove, um, weight training glove that I've been endorsing for the past seven years. Uh, these are special gloves that I wear during my heavy duty training. They are outfitted so that there's a strong wrist support. Uh, we have two straps here that you can wrap around your wrist, pull tight, and uh, you can uh, actually get some really good wrist support. These come in black and in brown and all the Max Muscle stores carry them, along with uh, Champ Sporting Goods and uh, a few other major sporting goods stores. Uh, weightlifting gloves are a must if you want to preserve the, uh, you know, the palms of your hands. You get pretty calloused. And, and like I said, these are made for extra wrist support, heavy-duty back training, um, bicep training, and whatever else. This happens to be my glove. But of course, they also carry uh, other kinds of glove. Harbinger. They got wrist support uh, for people that don't need the glove. They also have the straps. The powerlifting straps are for really good for when you're doing back and you have a weak grip. You want to make sure that you have these. I carry these around with me all the time for back and for biceps because my grip has a tendency to give out a lot faster than the actual muscle I'm training. So straps are a must. When you're doing legs, especially on squats and leg presses, the knee wraps are imperative if you're using heavy enough weight. I don't just wear these for looks. If I'm going to put knee wraps on my, uh, my knees, 
I probably got a lot of weight on the bar. So you don't want to waste your time wrapping your knees up to look good. You want to use these for balance and stability when you're doing heavy legs. Okay, weightlifting belts. A lot of weightlifting belts and a lot of companies that make them, different widths, different thicknesses, extra padding. You want to find a belt that's good for you. You don't want to get a belt that's too big and too bulky or too long, because as you diet down, these notches are going to get smaller and smaller, and it could get smaller and smaller week to week or month to month. So you don't want to have to be forced with making extra holes. So you want to make sure you buy a belt at the appropriate time in your diet and preparation. I wear a belt on every one of my workouts, whether I'm doing back, shoulders, chest, legs, or arms. I always wear a weightlifting belt. Of course, I wear my hat because it makes me stronger. I turn it around to the back. Okay. So many great people in the house that we want. How's it going? How's everything? Oh, yeah, my brother. I didn't. I'm making a video. You guys are ready. Oh, cool. Let's look at the camera. Look at this. Hi. It's important that I'm making a video. All right, hey, we're not making a video. So you're on it. I'm making a video. Oh, yeah, we're ready. Right after the Olympics, we're taking it to New York. Okay. Eating on airplanes and uh, not really being able to focus on preparing for the contest as I had as an amateur living at home. And uh, from then on, I vowed that if I was ever going to do the Mr. Olympia, I wouldn't do it unless I was in my best shape. And for eight straight years, I've been in the top five of the world. <laughs> I run these to play the drums in a punk rock band. <laughs> That's back in high school. Oh, yeah. Well, I know you you train back, you have to stretch, squeeze. You got a great back, you got a great chance. So you have to train heavy, hard, full range of motion. All right, last set. I normally don't train with my shirt off, but this is for you, six weeks out. Just to see the muscles being worked. And uh, I usually train in long sleeve, covered up things so I can sweat. It's pretty hot and humid here. It's about 98 degrees in California right now, so we're six weeks from the show. And I want to just so you can get a close up view of how the muscles work and what the body looks like when I'm working it. And uh, after today's back exercises, I'll put my shirt back on, stay covered up for another four weeks. And about two weeks out from the show, I'll take it off and we'll see what kind of physical changes I've gone through based on the dieting and the cardio. But today I'll train without my shirt on for you. Out of all the back exercises, this is definitely one of the hardest ones to do, most taxing on the body. When you get into doing drop sets, it's even worse. This ranks right up there with deadlifts. But uh, if I'm doing them and you're not, you'll know come day of the contest. It's a big thickness difference in doing the basics, heavy for reps, getting ready for a show, as it is opposed to using machines, trying to find the easy way out. This is how you do it. These work the inner portion of the back. We're doing close grip. Work on the middle lat thickness. And uh, 
I think of myself as an Olympic rower when I do this exercise. I want to stretch as far forward as I can so that I have a long row all the way back. I'm trying not to swing my shoulders back. I'm just stay perpendicular. Pulling it in tight to my stomach, right to my belly button. And literally squeeze it, squeeze the muscle to bring out the detail. And each set is heavier than the next. I usually go up about 40 pounds each set. Maxing out at 300, which is all the machine can hold. I like to do about 12 repetitions. If I can't get the 12 repetitions with the weight that I'm using, instantaneously I drop set. Because I gotta get 12. That's the magic number in here. Once again, stretch and squeeze is the main thing when you're doing back, biceps, quadriceps. Stretch and squeeze. All right. These are just pull downs to the rear. Usually I alternate these with pull downs to the front. When I jump to the back, I usually picture myself on stage doing a rear back double bicep. So I don't need a whole lot of weight here. I actually want to squeeze the muscle as I pull it down. In order to do that, you have to control the weight, not let the weight control you. This isn't going to get me real big, but it'll definitely help bring out the cuts and the detail. Three, bring it down to the base of the neck. Four, five, and come all the way up. Six. Seven. You don't want to try to waste any energy in between sets, talking with your friends, distracting you from your workout. That's why I require all my workout partners to count the repetitions. That way I know they're paying attention, number one, to the workout, and number two, they're not inviting other people to come into the workout and distract them by talking about football, movies, girls, or whatever. So to keep the pace and the rhythm, we count each other's reps, and we make sure that they don't need any spots or if we want to do drop sets. We're there to do it, so the good thing is it keeps the momentum of the workout going. Come on, let's go. Just quick tips on abs. Usually I do three exercises for abs. I do the incline, which I'm doing now. I do the crunches, and I do leg raises or knee ups. I pick three exercises, I do three sets, and I usually do 30 repetitions. I do abs two days in a row and take a day off, two days in a row and take a day off. So um, my abs get a lot of work, but in overall volume, the reps are less and the sets are less. Rather than doing 10 sets of abdominals, 50 repetitions a piece, I'd rather do a shorter abdominal workout where I just constantly work the muscle as I'm inc incorporating car cardiovascular and a low fat diet. That way my ab workout takes maybe 10 minutes short and sweet, just enough to stimulate the muscle. I'm not trying to make my abdominals grow bigger. I'm just trying to detail it so that when I do diet down the fat, burn it off on the cardio, you see a nice abdominal wall, upper, middle, and exterior on my serratus. So let me go another set. Now we've come to another very important aspect of bodybuilding, professional or amateur, and that's the nutritional supplement line. Generally speaking, I don't take supplements in the off season because I'm eating such a wide variety of foods. I get a lot of different sources of minerals and vitamins from all of those foods. But when I get ready for a show, which usually begins about 16 to 12 weeks out before a contest, I start training twice a day, two hours at a time, I'm doing an hour of cardio, I'm tanning in the sun, I'm doing photo shoots, a lot of energy is being expended and I have a very narrow food source to get my vitamins and nutrients. That's where I start implementing the supplements. And generally, I don't go out looking for specifics in supplements, I try to take a very wide variety of supplements to complement the kinds of foods I'm already eating. So why don't I start off with the things that I take, my favorites getting ready for the Mr. Olympia. Uh, I usually have a tendency to take lecithin, and I'm not really going on brand names here. Lecithin is lecithin. It helps metabolize the fat and get the, the uh, fatty acids in your system and out of your system as you get ready for a contest. That's the most important thing is you want to burn fat. Lecithin helps. Another good uh, combination is inositol and choline. And I generally take all of my vitamins with my breakfast uh, in the morning and then I take another portion of vitamins in the evening after my second workout. Inositol and choline along with my B-complex. My B-complex and B6 and my B12s 
Those are all fat burning components of uh, supplements and I take them all con in conjunction with each other to help try to burn off the body fat. I take a lot of vitamin C, again my inositol and choline. I take zinc, calcium, magnesium, my multi-mineral and my multivitamins. Um, I don't necessarily consider myself a scientist when it comes down to taking supplements. I do know that calcium, magnesium is of the mineral line. Uh, that you lose in sweat when you tr when you train two or four hours a day. You lose a lot of sweat. You lose a lot of vitamins and minerals. I take a good quality multivitamin as well as a multivitamin pack. Sometimes as a professional bodybuilder, you take more than you necessarily need. And what your body can't use, you will uh, lose it in the toilet and your body will excrete it. Um, generally, after I train, I take a, a nice amino acid drink to try to get the carbohydrates and amino acids back into my system because I'm depleted. Um, and the G4 seems to help a lot. I take a little bit of carnitine as, as well. Uh, I take two forms of carnitine, the uh, uh, capsule form, 250 milligrams, and um, the line by American Bodybuilding Products. And uh, again, there's no real specific differences in terms of companies and brands. Um, I happen to get my vitamins free. So that's my carnitine trip. Uh, I take my vitamin D and I take my chromium picolinate. Vitamin D uh, is very common in milk and dairy products, which I cannot have while I'm training for a contest. Therefore, I supplement it with a vitamin. Um, a lot of times in the off season, especially when I'm training really heavy, uh, before I start my diet, I take uh, a little bit of creatine monohydrate, the kicks and mass here, and the Metaform. I usually take that after I train to uh, get an extra energy boost. And um, here's another form of amino acids, essential amino acids. I generally take these immediately after I finish my workout in the morning and in the evening since I do train twice a day. I don't put a whole lot of credence in spending money or buying products if I didn't think they work. These are insurance policies. I eat my food first. If I have $20 in my pockets, the number one thing I'm going to do is try to find the primary sources of quality protein and quality carbohydrates. I go to the grocery store. I'd much rather grab a T-bone steak, a dozen of eggs, uh, a bag of potatoes, and some rice for 20 bucks than to go out and drop by a protein powder in place of that. Um, the protein powders and the supplements are all insurance policies so that if you're eating six times a day uh, and you're still trying to get in some calories and you don't have the time to eat it or cook it, that's where a protein powder might come in uh, to boost your protein intake or a high caloric drink in order to boost the intake of calories that you're trying to take in. Spend your money wisely. Use it as an investment, as an insurance policy when you are training uh, to the extreme and you need fast recovery and recuperation. That's where these products are going to help you. Um, and in the off season, eat and eat well. Eat well var uh, varieties of foods, fats, carbohydrates and proteins and you'll be much better off as an athlete and you'll recover a lot quicker. Okay, what I'm trying to do here is trying to find music for uh, the Mr. Olympia. And I guess the most important aspect of anyone's posing routine is the music. The music is the statement, and uh, I just happen to be the performer in the show, but I think most often than not, a lot of times, a lot of bodybuilders get on stage and they pose to background noise. Um, I'm one of those bodybuilders that when I started bodybuilding, I was taught uh, by a friend of mine that your music makes a statement and uh, with every song I choose I choreograph my routine around that song so I have a tendency to pose to slow much more dramatic music put more emphasis on my training or on my uh, transitions and uh, actually hitting the pose more so than I do the brutality of bodybuilding and you know just background noise and hitting most muscular shots I like to think is bodybuilding a um, as a stage and this is my art and I'm putting it on display and I want you to enjoy it more than anything else rather than cringe and squirm in your seat as something that's gross or you know a little bit too brutal I want it to look more as a work of art. Uh, Lebrada posed along the lines that I do 
uh, Bob Paris, and of course uh, John Brown and Vince Taylor. Uh, to me, that's much more artistic bodybuilding and presentation and posing. So my music tends to be a little bit slower, a little bit more romantic, and uh, every song that I pose to has meaning. And so as I select my artists, you'll notice that most of these people from Brian McKnight to Mariah Carey and Luther Vandross and John B and Prince and Janet, they all sing a variety of slow songs. And again, I have a nice big selection in front of me and in back of me to choose and find something that will make a statement. And in New York, I plan on trying to make a statement. And I think uh, the hardest part's not the diet, the hardest part's not the training, the tanning or the photo shoots, but actually when it gets to the nitty gritty, um, the hardest part is my signature. And that signature comes in the form of a song and trying to find something that represents my personality and uh, my charisma. So I'm trying to bang my head against the wall and find the right song. And I, I wish and hope that most bodybuilders put a little bit more emphasis and time in taking time to find something that's suitable, that represents their physique so that we can all enjoy their physiques and their presentations as well. Um, there's a few bodybuilders out there that I remember due to their posing routines and due to their songs. And uh, I guess my song, my signature, uh, started off back in 1987 with the, a performance to the Dream Girls. And uh, this is it right here. I'm telling you I'm not going. It was a Broadway performance uh, and I brought it to stage. And I think now when anybody hears the song, I'm telling you I'm not going in a bodybuilding form, they think of Sean Ray uh, as well with Vince Taylor. Um, he has, I believe I can fly by R. Kelly. So I like to put a stamp on it and there's been very few bodybuilders that own a song. Um, Phil Hill used Phantom of the uh, Opera and uh, nobody can pose to Phantom of the Opera the way that Phil Hill did back in 1988 at the Mr. Olympia. And so there's memorable performances that are tied in to uh, music. And so I'm trying to be selective and find something that not only I feel comfortable with, but that you'll enjoy. So we'll see what that'll be in about four more weeks. Another day in paradise. It's another job. Let's go. But when I come into the gym, my mindset is such that uh, every workout counts. Every day I'm getting a step closer to my ultimate goal and even if I don't win the contest, I'm doing everything I can do within my physical limitations to be fully prepared. And uh, I'm three weeks away from the Mr. Olympia. I was 219 pounds yesterday. And um, I feel strong, I feel confident, I'm refreshed. Uh, the one main objective is always there. And that is at the end of the day when I get to New York City and I step on stage, I have to ask myself as I look in the mirror, did I do everything physically and mentally possible to be prepared? Am I ready to go into combat against the likes of Nasser, Ken Wheeler, Kevin Lavroni, and Ronnie Coleman? And uh, every day, the good part about my attitude is that I'm very optimistic, and every day I reflect and say, yeah, I left it in the gym, I did my best, and let's, let's get on with the next day. And so here we are, I'm gonna do a little chest workout today. Uh, I'm training by myself. Um, which is customary about a month before a show because I train a little faster, a little lighter, and uh, my workouts are a little more intense because of the speed. So enough talking, let's get down to business. For me, three weeks before a contest, 150 pounds is like 180 pounds, uh, which is what I usually will handle in the off season for about six reps. So uh, obviously the bigger you are, the more you should be able to handle. So sometimes I get a little confused when I see somebody the size of Dillette or uh, you know the size of Fuchs or one of those guys and they're over there messing around with 100 pound dumbbells and they weigh 300 pounds you know and here I am at you know 215 220 pounds and uh, I'm handling dumbbells around 180 160 150 range and when you start putting it into relativity uh, that's what I say pound for pound you know I'll take a 300 pounder on any day because most of the time uh, as they diet down and start to lose strength, they start feeling sorry for themselves. you never get that out of me. Like I said before, I may not be the biggest, I may not be the strongest, but what I do works well for me. And uh, 
you'll find the quit in here. So let's move on to uh, some incline flies, okay? That's all. Usually when you're training for a contest of this magnitude, or otherwise, if it's a city, state, local, national, international, world championship, when you're this close to a contest, you've got one set of eyes that you can really trust. And that's those looking back at you in the mirror. So uh, granted, if you have to make a certain weight class, the scale has to play an important role. But even more than that, you gotta use the mirror as your guide. It's not my best friend, uh, but I do use it as a measure of my pro progress. So when I look in the mirror, I know the mirror is not lying back at me. Whereas I may have friends or fans that tell me I look great when I really don't. It's very hard to fool myself into believing that I look good when I don't, when I look into the mirror. So at this point in time, three weeks out from the show, I'm constantly trying to gauge my progress by what I see back in the mirror. Uh, today I'm doing chest. So of course, I'm finished training my chest, I gotta look in the mirror, assess my upper body, my arms, my triceps, my shoulders, my traps, my abdominals, all in relationship to my chest. Now, granted, there's a certain time of day that I pose my whole body, but right now, I've pumped a lot of blood into my chest, so I'm really swollen right now. Now's the time to squeeze it for that very last little detail and flex it all in concert with the other surrounding muscles, the delts, traps, triceps, and biceps, and abdominals. So I'm gonna be focusing on that in the mirror as I study and analyze my physique. I don't look in the mirror at admiration or satisfaction because then you become content. And when you become content with your progress, there's somebody coming up behind you or somebody ahead of you that's working harder. They're not satisfied, and I'm never satisfied with what I see. And more often than not, three weeks before a show, I'm not gonna necessarily like what I see, but I realize I've only got 20 days, 19 days to improve on what I do see. And um, this is the stage when I wanna rip it up and cut it up. So as I look in the mirror, from my perspective, what I'm looking at isn't necessarily satisfaction in the detail or the pump or the size or the fullness, but what can I do to make it even that much more crisp, that much more tight? And that might come in the form of more repetitions on my next workout, maybe a little heavier weight, maybe a little lighter weight, maybe a little bit of a more cardio, maybe a cut back on my carbohydrates, but there's the manipulation. I and I alone can see how to change that um, over a period of three weeks. But right now, I wanna see where I'm at. And chances are I'm not gonna like what I see. But that's the mark of a champion, never being satisfied and always trying to be better. I told you guys earlier, I probably wouldn't like what I see when I look in the mirror three weeks out from a show. And that's probably more due to the fact that with three weeks there's so much more I can do still. And uh, it's satisfactory, but I need to be more ripped and I need to hang on to the size as the weeks go along. Uh, grow closer to the show. So uh, the object is for me from here on out is pose, pose, pose. I gotta pose every day. I've got pictures to take. Still some tanning to do. I've gotta keep myself hydrated as much as possible. I've already probably drinking about a gallon of water today. My day started at 5.30 this morning. I was in the gym, I did 50 minutes of cardio. 25 minutes on the treadmill, 25 minutes on the bike. Went home and I ate my breakfast, took a shower, came here, and uh, trained chest and filmed this video. From here I'll go and eat some chicken and rice, and I got a photo shoot at 12 o'clock with uh, Flex Magazine for abdominals and calves. I'll eat again after that. I'll go to the suntan bed and tan for a half an hour. I'll go home and take a shower and lay down. Wake up and go back to the gym and finish doing biceps, triceps, and another 50 minutes of cardio. And my day will end right around seven o'clock, just enough time to catch about an hour of the football game on Monday night. And uh, I'll probably wind up waking up at about 10 o'clock and eating some egg whites before I call it a day. And that's pretty much a typical day from here on out. Um, only one thing will change between now and the show and that is I'll cut back gradually on my cardio as my show gets closer. Um, so right now I'm doing 50 minutes twice a day. Next week I'll probably be down to uh, 30 minutes twice a day. And the last week I won't be doing anything. Um, but every day I'll be posing. So with three weeks left to go, 
We'll see what happens when we get to New York City, baby. All right, peace out. All right. Uh, <laughs> Final countdown, baby. Dorian Yates is not competing because of his injured tricep that he... The question was, uh, when Dorian withdrew from the contest, was that a motivating factor for me? Um, I was competing in this contest long before Dorian won uh, the Night of Champions back in 1990-91. So no, Dorian wasn't my motivating factor uh, getting ready for this contest. And what's he going to look like? This time I didn't have to worry about what any of the competitors looked like. I had to make sure what I saw in the mirror was exactly what the judges would see on the day of the show. And so far, up to this point, I'm very pleased with my progress. Um, and I was injury free, and I trained a lot longer for this show. But the motivation didn't come from Dorian not being here. The motivation came from me trying to fulfill my destiny, and that's to be the next Mr. Olympia. Sean, who wins the Mr. Olympia this year? I hope it's the best guy that wins the Mr. Olympia. I've always hoped that. It's my 10th Olympia. I've always said that the best guy should win. I think there's been some controversial decisions, but there's always going to be controversial decisions when it's a subjective sport and it's a matter of opinion. But hopefully this year, without a standard, the most complete physique will represent the world of bodybuilding. And were you more encouraged this year than ever before? I was more encouraged because I wasn't competing and training for a certain standard to compete against. And since none of us knows what that standard is, we've all got the same kind of enthusiasm and excitement to hope and pray that it's us that they're looking for, namely me. Okay, I'm here in New York. It's uh, Saturday, October the 10th, uh, the big showdown. My 10th appearance at the Mr. Olympia. But of course, this contest is going to be won and lost in the prejudging. So uh, my expectations as of now is, of course, to be called out in the first call out. That's important. Uh, I weighed 212 pounds when I arrived here in New York City. Um, by the time I hit the stage, I hope to be about 215 because I've been putting more carbohydrates back into my system and over the last 24 hours I've been dehydrating my water. Um, so there's a small manipulation that's a timing uh, thing, but I've been monitoring what I look like in the mirror, whether I should drink a little bit, cut out a little bit, eat more carbs. And when I say carbs, I'm eating sweet potatoes and dry baked potatoes. And I like to eat dry oats with baby food and bananas, um, something sweet there. Um, I won't tell you all of my secrets, but it seems to, to help fill me out a bit. And I drink uh, small quantities of water with each carbohydrate meal but I'm not you know, drinking a lot because I'm trying to excrete more water than I take in at this stage. I got about uh, two hours before I hit the stage, and so once this interview is concluded, uh, you won't hear anything from me until after the finals. And, of course, the, the main thing about winning the Mr. Olympia, my whole journey to this contest, has a whole lot more to do with coming full circle. I've been in the top five for the past eight Mr. Olympias, uh, my first one, remember I started at 22 years old in my first Olympia in 1988, 10 years ago. I was 13th place, uh, which means I wasn't there in the final ceremonies to get a ribbon around my neck, shake Joe Weider's hand, uh, do the final pose down. That was my first experience to the Mr. Olympia. Since then, I managed to stay in the top five, um, and I've been five, fifth once, I've been fourth twice, I've been third uh, three times, and I've been second twice. So even though to the average bodybuilder, um, those are the signs of success. To the competitive bodybuilder, the one that's trying to be number one, um, at the end of the day, I want to have that sound out trophy sitting on my fireplace and the gold medal wrapped around my neck and the sense of uh, coming full circle. So I'm almost there. Um, my mind and body and spirit are one right now. I feel highly confident, and I think that confidence came from my preparation for this show. So regardless of the outcome, not setting myself up for defeat, um, there's nothing that I can actually go back and say I should have done this and if I had only done that. My preparation has been spot on, my focus has been right there, um, but my main focus is to get that trophy so that we can mainstream and commercialize uh, bodybuilding as a whole and as an industry so we can get some public recognition to encourage other bodybuilders to do the same and follow in, in that uh, footsteps of win the contest, now promote the contest. So this has a 
special significance for me to actually be number one, not number two or number three. And to do that, I realize that I'm up against the best in the world, not taking anything away from Kevin Lavroni and Flex Wheeler and Nasser El Sambadi, all of which have been second in the Mr. Olympia. But none of them have the experience that I have. None of them have followed the journey that I followed. And I think none of them have earned it and paid their dues the way I have. I'm the veteran of the group. This is my 10th Mr. Olympia. And in my mind, I've earned it and I deserve it. And I'm coming here to get it. So we'll see you in a little bit and hopefully we'll have some good news for you. Enjoy the ride. Mr. Olympia, Sergio Olivia. Mr. Olympia, Vince Taylor right here. Co MC <laughs> Two legends, all right. This is Larry Scott over here, the first Mr. Olympia. All right. Thank you. Kevin Laroni, the Maryland muscle machine. <laughs> I'm really I'm <laughs> oh, Well, I'm back in California. It's the day after the Mr. Olympia. And as you know, uh, with every start, there's got to be an ending. And this seems to be the end. We've come to the, the conclusion of our video. Um, just to recap what's taken place over the past 12 weeks, I started out at uh, 232 pounds. I dieted down for 12 weeks. And uh, going into Saturday afternoon's pre-judging, I was the heaviest I'd ever been in competition. Um, I was somewhere between, probably by the time I hit the stage, 214 to 216 after carving up and dehydrating. Um, and from a personal preparation standpoint, there's nothing I could have changed or would have changed or would have, yeah. And uh, I remember back when I started bodybuilding, somebody said uh, I was too small to ever be a professional bodybuilder. And here it is 11 years into my pro career, and every one of my workouts has been fueled with that one comment about somebody telling me what I couldn't do. So with all the compliments received throughout the year and all the pats on the back in the gym, we remember the one negative comment that the one competitor or enemy has made about us, and we use that to energize our workouts. I think Ronnie Coleman said it uh, quite candidly. You know, Sean, the one thing that stuck with me was you called me a 100 to 1 long shot. And I take my hat off to the new Mr. Olympia, Ronnie Coleman. Um, surprised me and everybody else. I mean, the guy came in 15 pounds heavier and was hard and dry. Uh, he'll be a worthy champion. In the end, after all of my hard work, I wanted to walk away with the Sandow Trophy more than anyone. And I walked away with a fifth place prize money. Um, that's not to say that I wasn't the best on the day. That was 12 judges' opinion for that day. And if you polled the audience, you might come up with a different champion. And I understand the dynamics of professional bodybuilding so that I couldn't personalize and internalize a fifth place defeat. For me, it was a fifth place victory. I'm one of five of the top best physiques on the planet Earth and have been for nine straight years. I have nothing to hold my head down about. I'm in good company losing to Flex Wheeler and Ronnie Coleman and uh, sharing the stage with Kevin Lavroni. So on this level of bodybuilding, you have to understand it's a business. And the business starts now. I took care of my contractual obligation and competed in the Mr. Olympia. I didn't fulfill my destiny of becoming the 10th Mr. Olympia, but I was there. I fought the battle. I survived without any scars. If anything, it was a learning experience for me in how to grow up, deal with defeat, uh, 
learn the meaning of camaraderie. I think all of us put our differences aside for one day. We fought the battle, and when it was all over, uh, we were all shaking hands and patting each other on the back. I mean, those people, those 5,000 people were there to see us. So, and I got paid for being there. Um, I don't want to diminish the fact that I would love nothing more than to be Mr. Olympia and be officially recognized by my peers and the judges and the world as the best bodybuilder on the planet Earth. The one reality I walked away from this contest was that that may never happen. Not in an official standpoint of view, but in my heart and soul, my track record speaks for itself. Um, people polarize to my, uh, my work as a bodybuilder, my work ethic, um, my articles, my comments, my opinions, and my personality and charisma. They polarize, polarize towards that because this is who I am. And in the end, the judges can put, put me fifth, they can put me 15th. But what you see in Sean Ray is what you get. I'm a fighter, I'm a competitor, and most of all, uh, I have my head screwed on straight. I got engaged the night of the contest. I have a bright future ahead of me. My life is just beginning. Um, I have a lot of things to look forward to. Uh, my career's not over by a long shot, but the perspective of my career is put in, in focus. I think that bodybuilding is now becoming a sport where like the NBA, you have a lot of different personalities, you have a point guard, you have a, a forward, you have a, a centers, and you have a, a shooting guards. And now, if I relate bodybuilding to basketball, it seems like bodybuilding is now becoming a sport where we have all centers. They're all a certain height and they're all a certain weight. And uh, the sad part is I'm on the lower end of that spectrum. I'm 5'7", 215. At 5'7", 230, it's not necessarily going to make me a better, more competitive bodybuilder because I'm still giving up four and five inches in 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 pounds to the bigger guy. And this sport right now, it seems to be cemented in the bigger, the better. And Ronnie Coleman at 280 pounds represents size. Nasser at 280 represents a lot of size. And so I can't play that game without ruining my physique. And before I ruin my physique, I'll, I will reevaluate my career and, and my competition in the future as to which direction I'll go. Right now, I'm hoping that you've learned a valuable lesson in terms of getting ready for a contest, understood the journey that it takes and the discipline that it takes to make it to the big show. You may not have learned how to win the contest because I don't have the trophy to represent that, but I guarantee you one thing, I'm not holding my head down. I feel like I won a personal battle, and that was I wanted to put on more size, and I did that. I came in bigger, I did that. I kept the detail and definition while gaining six or seven pounds of muscle. Uh, for me, that's, that's winning the war. Um, that's fighting the battle and coming out and being happy. I'm not content, but I am happy with my personal uh, approach to this contest. But the one thing stands clear. Ronnie Coleman was a better bodybuilder on the day. Um, and out of all the top five guys, the most improved. And so at least they got that part right. And there was no politics in that. And Ronnie Coleman should enjoy being Mr. Olympia because... Uh, he gives us all something else to fight for in terms of personal improvements. I made improvements, uh, but once again, I've always considered myself a diamond in the rough, a work in progress, and it ain't over till it's over. So eat your Wheaties, stay focused, and stay hungry in the gym until the final countdown.
Here it is. Okay. Start over. Take two. Good? I was bored of shit. Oh, God damn. Shit. I gotta do these quarter turns serious, dude. Good. What are you doing? I don't know. I cross out. <laughs> That's it. That's all we need. Got it? Yeah. <laughs> to the final countdown. Is that pretty clear? I think so. Yeah, I think I covered all the bases. You sounded good. So you would introduce a Karen? Or... No. No, no. Not on this video. Uh -uh. Not on the video. That's another video. Okay.